Welcome and aloha. Thanks for joining us at Think Tech Hawaii. And we have the good fortune of having with us today Professor Vernelia Randall, Professor Emerita of the University of Dayton School of Law, and prior to that, with a uh, career in nursing, as I understand it. That's right. So it brings a variety of backgrounds to us. And one of the leading experts in nationally and internationally on race and racism and the law, and has a wonderful website, racism.org, on which you can find all kinds of materials, articles, perspectives, insights about race and racism. So welcome you to that. And Thank you. Tim Apicella, Think Tech host and raconteur and... Uh, <laughs> Good morning, Chuck. Thank you. All that stuff. All that so, stuff. I figured today, Professor Randall, because race and racism are such a well-developed expertise of yours, that why not talk about the one thing that the media and the candidates are not talking about in this election? And that's race, where we are, where we're going, and what these elections might have to do with any of that, how they might be impacted by it. So Professor Randall, you wanna start us off? Well, I think that's, thank you for that uh, introduction and uh, focus on it. I think one of the things that has been a great frustration to me is even though I live in Florida, uh, the, the discussion about around racism and what to do about it. And all the communities are affected, the Asian community, the Hispanic community, of uh, the black community. And the, the, what has frustrated me is the Democrats focus on saving democracy. Uh, that, I mean, that is kind of like a non-starter for communities who are suffering from uh, hate crimes and uh, not being able, economic issues that, that are disparate for them, uh, voting even. I mean, uh, we're the whole issue of uh, gerrymandering and uh, uh, the, millions of Americans who cannot voice their vote. And then obviously, you know, for me, one of the racial issues I believe is the, uh, the failure of the two party system to actually allow uh, really diverse political views uh, in it. And that turns a lot of people off. So uh, yeah, the discussion, the overt discussion about racism is always kind of low at all times. There's just an expectation that communities will turn out and uh, vote uh, uh, without regard to whether their interests are really being met. And those are great insights and perspectives. It's a little hard to talk about saving democracy for people who are living on the outside of what could even be called democratic and egalitarian opportunities for housing, education, healthcare, voting, and other basic rights. Right. And Tim, we touched on a few of those things in your great think tech session yesterday. What are your thoughts on where we are, where we're headed, and what this election may have to do with it? Yeah, I, I, I agree that this election is pretty much silent on, on the racial divides in this country. I agree that um, there are actually many things that are, that are in, you know, particularly focusing on, on racial issues, particularly the restrictions of voting access and how that impacts minority communities greatly. And um, those issues were discussed, oh, maybe five months ago, but they certainly haven't come back to the forefront um, now that we're this close to the election. What do I, what do I mean by that? Um, certainly the, the many states that 
uh, voted in uh, election restrictions, be it um, you know um, shortened days or or hours of voting access, um, uh, no assistance once someone's in line, uh, those kind of tactics that are overtly designed to impact um, minority communities and and their 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 desire to vote. Um, Gerrymander was mentioned, and I agree that it's ridiculous on how these gerrymandering lines have been drawn, these districts drawn, that basically cut um, the vote out, the representation out of the voting process. Um, I look at um, things that are just appalling, specifically DeSantis's uh, cheap stunt, uh, the trick to um, lie and, and cheat his uh, Venezuelans onto a plane and, and dump them in the middle of um, Martha's Vineyard. I mean, what a, what a tactic that was and how insensitive and how cruel that he basically um, pulled that stunt off and really not a lot of time, airtime to address that and the impact to a minority community, certainly a, a desperate minority community looking for legal access, legal, legal asylum process. And um, they get treated like that. Um, so um, not a lot of airtime uh, this time around. And again, the Democrats are focusing in on an important issue, and that is, you know, a potential loss of democracy through, um, you know, what I call the MAGA GOP and their tactics. But certainly there's room to talk about these things a lot, lot more. Well, what frustrates me about the discussion of the potential loss of democracy is that and my son, my oldest son, gets frustrated with me when I say this. He, he says it shuts down conversation. But when somebody says democracy to me, my my point of view is we don't have, never had a democracy. And the idea that what we're going to do, that the Democrats is going to save democracy, we don't have a democracy. We never had a democracy in the sense that we have had a system designed where everyone could vote. There, that has never been. And, and uh, in the early days, only landed white men could vote. Not, not even poor, land poor owner, white men. Landowner white yes, men. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know, and that was an intentional design. The idea, I mean, you know, think about it. No right to vote in the Constitution. No right to vote in the Constitution. Do you think that the people who started this didn't understand that when they, that the right to vote was essential, but they didn't want to have to give the right to vote to everyone because they were elitists who thought that they knew what was best and they didn't want the masses coming along and voting against them. And that view continues and has continued. And uh, the I so I I mean the frustration for me is. When we talk about saving democracy, we're not we're talking about saving this system that is designed to protect the elitist vote. And I'm not sure that's worth saving. Uh, maybe we ought to just get allow it, to, you know, to go as bad as possible and then start over somehow. And I don't know how that is, but I think what we have is not working. Well, and that's a great point, because not only do we not have a one person, one vote system, we don't even have a system in which all, all people, regardless of background, education, ethnicity, disability, or whatever, they can vote. <laughs> so we're a long way from <clears throat> that but you make a good point about the Constitution as well. The Constitution does not say the choice of the governed. It says the consent of the governed. Those are two different things, particularly coming from a landed, wealthy, white elite that created that Constitution and a landed, wealthy, mostly white elite 
<laughs> that seems to be trying to take it back to where they wanted it to be at that time. <laughs> Justice Alito in particular, but Justice Thomas and others as well. <clears throat> so Tim, how do we move this forward? Toward wow. <laughs> That's a tough real question. democracy. <laughs> They've been trying to move it forward for 245 years. And that's the bottom line is that this system has been built on preservation of economic preservation for the those who have the power and economic preservation ties into power preservation. And only slowly, very slowly in a civil war and women's suffrage rights uh, and now, you know, um, gay marriage rights um, have have we been able to slowly, slowly uh, try to distribute that power uh, in the form of a vote or in the, in the form of recognition of, of their dignity and their legal rights within our United States. So uh, 245 years is a long time, but in comparison to a lot of nations in this world, it's a, you know, it's a, it's, it's a drop in the bucket. Uh, how do we keep it going is, 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 is the media has to point, pinpoint those areas where inequity exists today, uh, be it in schools, be it in employment, be it in um, voting rights, um, and, and a, a shine, shining light on those inequities, those blatant points of discrimination, which now in the last five years, thanks to Donald Trump, is popular again. Uh, make America great again, uh, I think is make America racist again. And I think, Chuck, you and I spoke about this the other day, and uh, you know, I'll make a distinction between the MAGA GOP and the old GOP, the, the, you know, the GOP that was reasonable and uh, would see uh, and work across the aisles trying to pass legislation. Uh, but the mega GOP seems to um, be attracted to the types of Don, Donald Trump for, for a specific reason. And I believe it appeals to their inner racism. I believe it appeals to their sense of um, grievance that they've been shoved, shoved aside. And Donald Trump has appealed to their um, rep replacement theory concerns. And that is how he got his base. And that's how his base has spread even to the normal GOP. Um, and it's a factor that I don't know how to break. Uh, it's, it's a problem. And, and this kind of racism needs to go under the rock in which it belongs. It certainly is. A, you know, the thing is, is that it def the, the overt racism that Trump has uh, permitted to come back uh, to become visible because it never was gone. Never gone. I, I, the, 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 the issue is this, I, I, I think I'm in my 70s. So part of what I think has happened is that the grandkids of grand of people who never liked affirmative action and felt hot and in, and all of the stuff that went, that went, that was uh, I'm using affirmative action as a as the generic term for racial justice. They didn't like all of that, but during the '70s, they were sort of powerless to do anything. During the '80s, the process started to design to. Uh, empower the existing system to get their power back. And the Democrats worked with that by moving right instead of left. So every time we get a Democrat in power, they pass some laws that are helpful, but they also pass laws that appeal to the, the right. And so then they, they move their party right. Uh, so part of the problem, I think, is, is that the Democrat in terms of what they're doing are, is really not distinguishable in the middle from the Republicans. And so it's when you're concerned about all of this other stuff, uh, the the not just the whites, but the blacks and Hispanic and 
Asian and Native Americans are have some some of them not it's a lower percentage have the same concerns and so they move right to I think that the only thing is to really have a left party to really be able to offer really progressive ideas uh, and that would you know empower the that give the people a real choice in terms of difference. And I don't know how we get that. Uh, you know, the Green Party has done some stuff. The Socialist Party has done some stuff. But we, we unfortunately have not been able to build a power base on the local level uh, that is disruptive. And I, I don't know how we disrupt uh, the current system, because even if we push the overt Democrat, overt racist back under the rock, that doesn't deal with the colorblind racist, uh, the covert racist, and all the system and institutional racism that comes from Democrats and Republicans. Uh, I mean, the Democrats. Republicans are clearly the policy of the the party of the overt racist. But the Democrats are a party of the colorblind overt racist. So I don't I don't know how we deal with that. <clears throat> so <clears throat> Let me ask a strange hypothetical question. Who, <laughs> what if US politics, the parties <clears throat> like those in most of Europe <clears throat> were split? What if you split the Democrats into progressives and moderates and the Republicans into right-wing MAGA and moderates? <clears throat> would that be better for the choices that we would see We would need a constitutional change that got rid of the electoral college. Mm -hmm. We would need uh, some kind of change that assured representation in the Senate. We need a change in how the Senate is set up. And we, need, we would need a change in the Supreme Court to make sure that there is representation uh, on the court according to all of the parties represented. If we had that, then what we could, what I think would happen in the uh, presidential election would be uh, not, they would have to form a consensus government and to, because they would have to do that they would give, and I've seen this in some foreign countries, where in order to form a coalition government, they give something to the minority rep parties. So like, we want, we're the minority party, we help you get elected, we will help you form your party, we want representation in the Department of Education we want to head up the Department of Education. That's our payment for helping you form a coalition government. I think that I think that those kind of changes uh, would be very good for the country. Um, but I don't think that the things that I said need to happen would happen. <clears throat> So what are the obstacles to moving in that direction? What are the power groups that are going to resist that and maintain the status quo because it serves their interests best? Capitalists, billionaire capitalists, 
Uh, you know, I don't think we have a democracy, and I agree with your position on that. I think we have a plutocracy. Corporations are running this country, and they have for, for since the 1900s, or even before then. Uh, they weren't maybe call it corporations, but, um, you know, seems to me Teddy Roosevelt tried to do something about that and tried to break up some of these mega companies that were controlling Congress, controlling who got elected. And I don't think it's any different today. It's just a little bit subterranean, uh, especially with Citizens United, uh, dark money. Uh, it's alive and well. So I don't see a whole lot of change coming to uh, disrupt the status quo, not for one moment. And one of the things, Professor Randall, that you alluded to that we've seen is that historically, from the 30s with FDR up into maybe as long as into the 70s, there was some movement in some areas toward <clears throat> more de democratic opportunities for some of the groups that have been excluded more systemically. <clears throat> In the 1980s, with the advent of Reagan, trickled down economics and concentrated Republican power and strategy on restoring the prior system with power elite and the exclusions of the groups that had previously been excluded. <clears throat> Is that what's still happening now? I think they have access, they successfully designed, a, they successfully blocked the develop. In the 19, early 1900s, there were more parties who had more success in, in terms of affecting outcomes. And that what has happened, not just with the not just with the Republicans, but the Democrats, for instance, the Democrats and Republicans have worked together to uh, put in laws that make uh, third party representations, uh, independent representation difficult, even on a local level. Uh, and Democrats have worked to continue gerrymandering. And so the Democrats and Republicans have worked together to strengthen the existing system to exclude uh, the success, the ability to be sex. I got my uh, vote ballot to vote and I, I just threw it away. I frankly threw it away because there were no choices for me. There are any, and there was not even the ability to write in, which I'm like, okay, you for, in some cases, the person running, and I, what, what am I supposed to do? Vote for that person? Uh, for governor, there was DeSantis and Chris. Chris is a Republican who went became Democrat just two years ago. What am, you really think I'm going to vote for Republicans because they call themselves a Democrat? And there was yeah, but at no, least he's a at least he's a reasonable Republican. <laughs> <laughs> Only because he's out of power. Right. <laughs> I agree with but, that. <laughs> once he gets in power. He won't be as crazy as uh, DeSantis and how he talks, but he. One of the big problems with our system is is that people, mainly because of the voting, how quick we have turnover in voting, people are unwilling to take stance that's going to angry anger people. So whatever they get in, whatever that is in, whatever laws are in power, they don't undo them. That's Democrats, that's Republicans. They maintain the status quo and try to push. The Republicans are good about trying to push the party to the far right. And the Democrats are good 
about maintaining the status quo, which means maintaining uh, a system that is not good, not, not fair. And they do little things around the edge. But actually, I, there's a real frustration and anger that I had. Uh, the ballot was long, it was in small print, and there were no, there was no ability to say, I don't like either of these choices. Uh, none of the above, or write me in my own name because I think I'd do a better job and maybe <laughs> only get one vote. In none of the races, none of the races was that ability, and I it that's a deliberate design to have a forced choice election. I uh, you know people vote 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 and then force them into choices that they may not want to do. So, uh, I don't know. <clears throat> and we've seen examples of that. We've had our own in Hawaii with uh, a uh, former <laughs> potential presidential candidate who switched parties and switched allegiances and switched just about everything until she finally showed what people have who have known her have said are her true colors, um, which doesn't do much for people of color, unfortunately. So, uh, Tim, you made a good point. Is there media responsibility here in getting information to people that will help move us in a direction of greater range of choices of more factions that would force more negotiated consensus action yeah. by yeah, government? There is. Unfortunately, during the Ronald Reagan era, um, the fair, fair uh, communication standards, equal time, uh, was written out of the law, was mm -hmm. vanquished. So now you have no obligation to give anyone equal time, not to mention of any particular race, but any particular persuasion. Um, and this goes to the heart of our choices are limited to one or two things. And media is not reporting because they don't have to report. They're not forced to give equal time. And that is unfortunate because there are many issues that deserve not only equal time, but most likely greater time. Mm -hmm. But um, we just don't see it. And now we, we go to that which, um, you know, the news cycle is 24 hours because the attention span of the voting public is that of a gnat. And that's due to a lot of reasons, but um, you know, it's the sensationalization of news and media and coverage. And, you know, let's just say affirmative action, you know, it's an important subject, but you know, is it as important as a, sh a shooting situation in a school? It's not gonna get the headlines. And that's unfortunate because as long as that continues and the people are, are not aware of the issues and the, uh, you know, the inequities that surround us, nothing changes. And that's a good point because you can see that exemplified not only weekly and monthly, but even daily in the media. Recently, the media has all swung back and said, okay, it may not be a red wave, it's certainly not going to be a blue wave. Republicans are gaining momentum, even these so-called neutral media. They're promoting Chuck, the Republican bandwagon. Chuck, the public is being played as they've been played for 100 years. Um, you know, they want to make this into a horse race. Why? People are going to tune in. What's on when you tune in? Commercials, uh, ratings. Uh, the American public is being played, and it's right in front of our eyes yet we are numb to it, or some of us are numb to it. I, you know, the, the media, the, the thing I think about the media is they're corporate owned. Correct. And, and whether, they, whether they say they're neutral, they're not. They have a bias that is to the corporation that owns them. And the corporation, and the corporation that owns them 
is in the business of you know maintaining the status quo and so yeah they they do the uh they they are sensationalists and then the, even when they have these news panels it's it's like putting on one or two, two or three people who all have similar views uh uh for the narrow range of views that they are interested in promoting um main mainstream media is not interested in having people who have uh, really divergent views on the issues uh in fact-based divergent views uh and so that's and the people get fed that and if they only look at that, at the media that they're looking at, uh, I, I had extreme frustration uh, with uh, MSNBC, is that right? Uh, during Obama's administration. Uh, because uh, they, well, first of all, they, they crowded up their uh, room with people that they normally don't even give voice to black and brown people so they had shows that were headed by black and brown people and they brought black and brown people on and they didn't really have a different view of the world that uh that a white person in the same economic situation would have had and the problem during obama's administration seemed really implemented policies that was hurting black and brown people and i wanted people to get up on tv and say oh no his housing policy is horrible it's hurting black and brown people uh but that didn't happen so it the 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 structure is to to suppress, provide support and only pro go opposition to in some narrow way so it, it's not real opposition uh real inform informative of the problems and that's the problem with media i mean even today like uh uh they don't provide a real range of views on whatever issue they're trying to cover to the extent they do cover issues. Okay, so in our last minute, I'm going to ask each of you, if you were going to boil down to a succinct point, <clears throat> relating to race in these elections that you believe people should understand and keep in mind when they make their choices, when they vote. Tim, any thoughts? Which party is going to serve your bread and butter issues best? What party is going to serve your sense of fairness and justice best? Which party is going to represent the future for you and your family best? Uh, and if you can't come up with that answer, um, vote anyway. I, I'm a big believer that even if you're unhappy and you don't like the choices, vote. Because um, apathy is the great destroyer of all democracies, or in this case, our republic. And um, those politicians that wish to manipulate the people and uh, preserve their power base rely on apathy. and um, I am actually pleased, even though I didn't like how the results were always working out in the last election, we had more Americans voting than ever before as far as a percentage. And I find that encouraging. I will find it more encouraging when they make enlightened votes and we have better candidates that move this country forward in all areas of economic prosperity, race relationships, and uh, everything in between. Great. Professor Randall? Well, I'm not a vote anyway person. Uh, 
largely because I think they use voting the, that it's not apathy to not want a, uh, the choices that are being provided. It is a if you don't like the choices that are being provided for you, if they don't fit your value system, uh, there is no obligation, morally, ethically, or whatever, to vote uh, the lesser of two evils. Because in the end, it's still evil. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I. I kind of think that you should get your ballot, that you should understand the racial issues. I think that everything Tim said about looking at that, I think all of the questions that he said, exactly true. Go through that thinking process. At the end of the day, though, if you feel that neither party represents your what's best for you and your community, then you have to make a decision not to vote. Uh, and to maybe turn in a ballot that says none of the above and write on ballots in a way that says, look, I came, but you don't have my vote. I, I think forcing people into a forced choice is part of the flaw in our system. And that maintaining that forced choice allows people to say, oh, yeah, well, you know, it's not that good, but it's better than the other. And you think, you know what? I don't want to participate in choosing the stick you're going to beat me with. I did that as a child. My, my foster mother, when she she would make us go out and get the stick we were going to beat, going to get a whipping with, or the uh, strap that we were going to get a whipping with. And you get a lighter one, you get a, uh, one that you think ain't going to hurt that much. But at the end of the day, you get the whip that's going to beat you. And I so. I didn't do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't fun. <laughs> no, and it's not fun to choose the lesser of two evils when you know, when in your mind. Now, if that's not your thinking process, then don't go there. But if that is your thinking process, it's okay. It, it's okay to be, to have the idea that you're not gonna pick the stick to get beaten with, that you'd rather, you'd rather, even if it means that you're gonna get beaten worse, because they're going to pick something bigger. You'd rather take that than uh, participate in the choice of what's going to abuse you. So I'll just add that on. Professor Randall, Tim, thanks so much for your thoughts, your perspectives, your insights, giving us all a lot to think about. Come back and join us in a couple of weeks. Thank all of you. We took the time to watch this <clears throat> and best wishes to all of you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.